Yeah, oh my God, it's so good to be. Hey, I want to say uh, happy Pentecost weekend. I know it's Saturday night and, and Pentecost is tomorrow, the birth of the New Testament church. Uh, it is such an honor to be with you guys. I do want to say if you have your Bibles open to the book of Exodus, we've got a lot to cover. We've got a lot of things we need to cover, especially from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Uh, normally there would be a Bible in front of you, but since this whole outbreak uh, you have to come with your own Bible. You have to come with your own Bible now. So pull out your phone, come with your own Bible, and come with your own pen. And unfortunately, you got to bring your own snacks, okay? So we can't do any of that. So Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. So check it out. One of the things I want to say to everybody online is we've. this is our second service of today. We did a drive in church service at 8.30 this morning. Got the cops called on us. Hey! You know, you, you know, only you guys would cheer. Only you guys would cheer. You know it ain't no party to the police show up. And I just want to shout out to the Fresno PD. Such respect. So polite to us. Thank you so much, Fresno PD. Even told the young man that we were praying for him. He goes, you guys keep doing what you're doing. Let me tell the neighbors just kick back a little bit. Hey! So we do got to make a couple of adjustments. Apparently Chris is drumming way too loud. So we're still going to continue with our outdoor services. We just might lose a drum or two, you know what I'm saying? So, But uh, it was really nice, so shout out. I know the cops are catching some heat right now, but our officer was beyond nice, very cordial. We even simmered the neighbor down, so it's cool. But we're going to work with our neighbors because we want to be good neighbors. So this is our second service of the night. So here's what I want to tell you. I told you all that to say this. Uh, looking in the camera, if you don't feel comfortable coming to church yet, I don't want anybody to put you down. I want you to know that I'm praying for you. Online services will always be available, and I'm going to respect right where you're at. I'm going to respect that, and I'm still going to continue to pastor you, and I'm always going to love you. So I just want you to know that there's no controversy here. But for those of you who are like, hey, I'm ready to spread my wings and fly a little bit and check out a church service, remember, the prophetic word from the Lord is uh, the strength of Adventure Church is, uh, is in our creative ability to offer a multiplicity of services at various times. So here's my recommendation for you. When the registration opens, you need to put your name on it because spots all over the place fill up very fast and you'll find yourself on the waiting list, okay? Exodus chapter 34, so check it out. As we get ready to read, I want you to know, and, and, and first off, foremost, I gotta say this, we are going to the deep end of the pool right now. So if you're not familiar with the Bible, you're gonna have to play catch up and you have to watch this message on rewind, okay? As we're going to the deep end of the pool, I've got a special message for you today because today it's not just Pentecost weekend, but it's a Jewish tradition called Shavuos. Shavuos is known as the Feast of Weeks or as Jews commensurated as the time when Moses got the law from Mount Sinai. It's when he got the tablets from Mount Sinai and, 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 and the exact definition is this. It is, it, is, it is 49 days or 50 days from the Passover and the Jews call this festival Shavuos to take a look back at two significant things. Okay, First, agriculturally, it's, it, it, it marks the harvest time of the wheat and the barley and the grain. And number two, it, it's when the Lord gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Okay, Very important. you got to keep this in mind. I'm going to tie this all in to Pentecost Sunday. You're going to see it. So you're, going to, you're going to like it, I promise. Okay? So they are celebrating this festival that started, now watch this, that started on Thursday night. The Jewish people start the new day at night. Because why? Because in the morning it's a daybreak. See this? So they started at night. So they are actually ending. Uh, Israel is 14 to 12 hours right now ahead of us. So they've already ended the festival. Okay, he's got to make sense. So Thursday, Thursday night to Saturday night, they celebrate this. The Feast of Weeks is what they call it. Shavuos is the Hebrew term. And we call it Pentecost. Now, Pentecost and Shavuos is the same thing. It's watch, watch, watch. Pentecost is the Greek way to say it. 50 days. Pentecost. 50. Pente five. Zero. Okay? This is very important. Now, we're going to read Exodus 34, and I'm going to show you this festival and how it... It's New Testament implications are profound when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to throw this out to you. You're going to have to rewind this for you later to study. Unfortunately, the majority of us have taken a secular understanding of the Scripture. And then we come into Christianity where, where our early forefathers had a Jewish understanding 
and brought that into Christianity. So this, I, I wouldn't have had to explain anything if I just told them Shavuot, the Yashayim, they would have automatically knew. And we'd have moved right along. We've got to approach the scriptures from our Jewish, from our Jewish lineage and heritage. Because why? The Old Testament, watch this, is a type and a shadow of what is to come in the New Testament. Now I'm going to break this down to you. Exodus chapter 34, you don't have your Bible? It's right here. It said, the Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. Quickly, quick observation. Moses destroyed the first two original commandments, the, sa- the tablets. He destroyed them in, in, in a moment of anger, okay? First thing to note. So God tells him, you're going to have to get two more tablets, chisel them out, and I'm going to do it again. He says this, and I will write on them. Both times God wrote on them. This is what he says. The words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, present yourselves to me, therefore, on top of the mountain. Let's keep reading. Be ready in the morning and then come up on the Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of this mountain. No one else is to come with you or be seen anywhere uh, on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. He says, so Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones. And he went up on top of Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, and he's a gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. Maintaining love to a thousand generations and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet, excuse me, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and the children's children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed down on the ground at once, and he worshipped him. Last verse, verse 9. Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is, uh, this is a stiff-necked people. He's picking on his congregation now. I've never said this about you, okay? I've never said this is a stiff-necked, stubborn, hard-headed, burros, right? I've never said that. I promise you, I've never said that to the Lord. Uh, wicked generation, and take us as your inheritance. Guys, what you, I've never said that about you. I've always said, Lord, they're so gracious. They're so good to me. I love pastoring Adventure Church. Go easy on them. That's what I've said, Kim. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word. Lord, it is my prayer. As you speak to me, speak through me for the blessing and the benefit of your people. In Jesus' name, we all said... Okay, look at your neighbor and tell him he's probably lying. Go ahead. Yeah, I've complained once or twice. Okay, so let's, let's, let's pick it right up. Here we go. Exodus 34. This is a very important passage of Scripture because God decides he is going to give to his people. He is going to give to his people the law. Now, this is very, very important. This is very important, okay? He's going to give them the law. Now, listen. Moses did not write the commandments. Therefore, they are not suggestions. Moses didn't write them. He chiseled out the tablets because he broke the original two. But he gives them this on purpose. Why? First thing we need to understand is God wants to deliver the word of God to you. He wants to deliver the word to you. Right? So he's going to deliver the words of God. Now, now here's what's interesting. Here's what's interesting. In order... To be a nation, you got to catch this. In order to be a nation, you've got to have three things. There it is. You've got to have land, you've got to have people, and you've got to have a law. Let me say that again. Land, people, and law. You got to. If you're going to stake your claim, you've got to have these three things. Now, 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 now watch this. He's going to give them a land. Remember, they are coming out of Egypt. Remember, we've been going through the Passover. They came out of Egypt, and he was going to go to a land that he had promised Abraham way back in the beginning, even though there was inhabitants in the land, and they were going to have to fight their way in and fight their way out. He was going to give them the land, okay? Now, real quickly, real quickly, I must say this because you got to understand this is very important. I'm telling you, this is going to be very much the deep end of the pool. The purpose of Israel, according to one of the great sages, The purpose of Israel is not for Israelis to be safe. It is not for Israelis to find peace. It is for Jews to find freedom. Now watch this. 
The purpose of your regeneration in Christ, the purpose of you finding faith, is not for you to be safe. And it's not for you to have peace. It's for you to live free. Because, see, you can seek peace and pursue it, but you may never get it because you may be a persecuted church. But you can always find freedom because they may shackle your hands, but you're free in your mind. So if you would fight for freedom like you fight for safety, you'd probably be free by now. But we'll move right along. Okay, so we got a land, we got a people, and we got a law. So he said, listen, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to adopt you as my people. But there's one thing you need that's going to set you apart so that you're different, and that's a law. The law. I'm going to show you how to have good community amongst each other. I'm going to show you how to live in this community that will make you different. Now, why does he say that? Because he's talking to a group of people who just came out of a land where they had hundreds of gods. They had various festivals. They had various rituals. They had various decrees. He said, but I'm going to give you a law that's completely opposite of that law, antithetical to that law, different than that law, so you could be my people, so people will look at you as a different type of breed, a different type of something, a people who has a God. Now watch this. So let's go through why the importance of the law. First off, the law gives you a moral compass. It gives you a sense of delineating between right and wrong. It shows you, now if we look, now watch this. Let me explain this. If you look at it from a secular perspective and not a Jewish perspective, you got to be careful because you'll break down the commandments six and four. You'll say, hey, the first four commandments are between us and God, and the other six are between us and people. But if you follow your Jewish roots from the Old Testament to the New Testament, they've never broken it down six and four. It's always been five and five. It's always been five and five. Well, why, 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 is that, why is that so important? Because you won't understand that we have to look at this from the Old Testament eyes on why it's a moral compass. If you look at it from the perspective of the five and five, you'll see that God is already commanding them to be different. First off, they said, he said, you will never have a graven image of me. You will never bow down to, to an Osiris, you know, from Pharaoh. You'll never bow down to a calf. You'll never bow down to a bull. You'll never bow down. You won't bow down to a chicken. You won't bow down to a locust. Dagon, it doesn't matter. Dag, you know what I mean? It's just, it just doesn't matter. He goes, because you're not going to have any graven images. And you're not going to take the Lord's name in vain. Matter of fact, that's why Jews don't even say God's name. They say Yahashayim, which means literally translated the name. That's what it means, the name. Because they felt that name was so holy, they didn't want to mess it up. You got to catch this. You got to catch this. It gave them a moral compass to understand that God wanted to do something different. If you don't have a moral compass, you have this verse right here. In those days, Israel did not have a king, and all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Uh, to quote Drake, he basically is saying in, in this verse is, you do you and I'm going to do me. Mm. I didn't say he was a theologian. I said I was going to quote him. So in the gospel, there is no you do you and I'll do me. No, I'll serve God. That's gospel. And here it is. There is no, well, that's your truth and I have my own truth. No, there's just truth. And you get the choice whether or not you want to believe it. And by the way, that doesn't work in anything else. You can't get on the scale and be like, that's a lie. <laughs> I've wanted to. Devil is a liar. Or it's broken and need batteries, one or the other. Y'all tracking with me? It's just showing you the truth. It's like the mirror. That mirror is fake. I don't believe it. I say that every week the videos come out. I'm like, I did not, I was not that chunky last week. I'm a little bloated. Look, anyway, okay. It gives you a sense of a moral compass. Now watch this, watch this. When you have the moral compass, you have a sense of direction. When you have a moral compass, when you get lost, you'll know how to get back. Did you catch that? It's not a question of will you get lost. It's when you get lost, you'll know how to come back. Now Why? Because the quickest way to ruin a society is to not have a moral compass and for everybody to live the way they want. Hope you get this. Now, I love one of the great, one of the great uh, uh, rabbis, one of the great sages, Rabbi Kakiva. He said this. He said, ready? A little bit of light will push out an immense amount of darkness. And we call God's word a light. 
So if we could get the light inside of us, oh, how much darkness will it push out? Was it not David who said, thy word is what? A a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? It's the word of God. So if we find ourselves, here it is, if we find ourselves being surrounded by darkness, then dim is the light within us. And all we got to do is add more light inside of our soul. So then what? So let's, 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 let's keep going. Let's keep going. If you have a moral compass, then you have a sense of purpose. You have a sense of purpose. Let me show you Joshua 1.8. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on a day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. If, excuse me, it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. So he said you are to do what? Meditate on it day and night. Why? Because it will give you a sense of direction. So what, it, what in actuality is being said here is, listen, I love you so much. I'm in love with my people so much. I can see that before you acknowledged me, you were lost in a wilderness. You were lost in your bondage. But I love you so much that I'm going to give you this sense of purpose. I'm going to set you apart. I'm not just some big guy in the sky. I am yours and you are mine. He literally takes ownership. And when you take ownership, you take responsibility. I'll prove it to you. Buy your first car. Pay with your hard-earned money. You're going to be picky on who rides in it. Huh, you ever, has that ever happened to you? you? Bought a new car and your kids want to get in all stinky? You're going to walk home. Or you're going to go change before you get in here. How many know what I'm talking about, right? It's, it's the truth. When, when you take ownership of something, there's a sense of pride about it. And there's a sense of protection about it. And it's a fierce protection. And God said, because I've given this to you, I've made you my people, I've set you apart. You're going to be different. And this is going to bring the success in the community. I'm going to give you a recipe for success. If we could keep your moral integrity, if we could keep your moral integrity, you will not fail as a society. So he gives them this to prove the love that he has for them. Now, it's in fact the blueprint for how we are to live our life. Why? So Moses comes down as the messenger and he proclaims this message to the children of Israel. And there's a reason for this, and I want to share it with you. You got to understand that in Jewish tradition, they believe when you become a son of the law, known as a bar mitzvah, woman of the law, or a young girl of the law, bat mitzvah, son of, woman of the law, mitzvah, right? Or Torah. What they're saying is, you go from an ordinary person, they would say it in in their own Jewish idiom, you go from an an ordinary uh, Joe, Yosef, right, Joe, to an extraordinary, because the law of God illuminated in your heart takes you from an ordinary person to an extraordinary person, because you will, in fact, look and live different. So he's saying there's a transformational power. <clears throat> That's why it always surprises me on who we let influence our lives through our ears. If you let the wrong person influence you, you will live a very fearful, frightful life. You have to be careful on who is speaking into your life. And if you find yourself in darkness, aha, uh-huh, it's obviously the wrong person. You need to allow the word of God to speak into your life. So he says you go from this ordinary person, and what he's saying is this to you. I love you so much, I'm going to give to you one of the most precious things that I can give to you that I will carve out with my own hand. And it's my instruction for you to live a blessed life. And and I promise you, when you follow it, we will be in covenant together. I'll prove it to you. Look at Isaiah chapter 49. A lot of scripture tonight. The Lord answered, can a woman forget the baby she nurses? Can she feel no kindness for the child to which she gave birth? Even if she could, even if that was possible, I love it. Forget her children. I will not forget you. See, I have written your name on my hand, Jerusalem. 
and I will always think about your walls. And you know, this is, this is a phrase. This is what he's saying. And I will always have you in my heart. He is giving you a no-hassle guarantee that he is with you, that he is inscribed. And for us as Christians, Jesus bears the markings where? On his hands and on his feet. And, we, and he lives in our what? Heart. He's saying we're one. I will not forget you because I've done all this not for me, but for you. Watch this. He didn't give us the, the, the Torah, the law, for himself. He gave it for us so that we wouldn't kill us. Now watch this. Do you think if more people were following that today, we'd have the problems we have today? Think about where we're at in this society. Riots are happening right now. Protesting's happening right now. Some of it's good. A lot of it not good. A lot of it not good. But if we were following, love thy neighbor. We wouldn't even be here in the first place. Get off the man. Is it that hard? You see where I'm coming from? If we were following, wouldn't it enhance us as people? So why do we fight against it? And I'll tell you why. Because we have a sin nature and we'd rather do me instead of somebody else telling me how I'm supposed to do. Now watch. Now let's go over to the New Testament. We are celebrating what we would call Pentecost for us as New Testament believers. Pentecost, okay? Now, we know that this is just a conclusion of Shavuos or the time when he gave us the law. This is, now, now you're going to have to really catch it because I'm going to start to tie these two together. Now, what I find interesting, real quickly, real quickly, what I find interesting is Jesus, after he resurrected, according to Acts chapter 1, 3, which I could quote the whole thing, it goes this, Acts 1, 2, and 3, goes this, in my former book, O Theophilus, I began to write to you about what Jesus began to do and to teach up until the day that he ascended unto heaven. Therefore, showing many signs, convincing proofs, he appeared to those for a period of 40 days. That's verses 1 through 3. Gave convincing signs and beliefs. Of what? Showing himself to people. Now watch this. Um, real quickly, if Jesus already resurrected on the third, third day, why did he hang out for another 40? Because we know 40, according to Jewish tradition, is what? Is a time of testing and trials. He was showing everybody he was the real deal. The Bible says that he appeared to some 500 people. I think that's 1 Corinthians 15. 500 people got to see him. Now watch this. What I find even more interesting, and I've been, and I'm going to show you a picture here in just one second. He goes to the Mount of Olives, where Luke is picking up Acts chapter 1. We've been to the Mount of Olives. We were there. And it overlooks, and if you're standing at the top of Mount of Olives, right, Eunice and Michael were there. If you're standing and you're looking down, you can see the road where he did, where he did the walk with the palm branches, Hosanna, right? When he did the palm, when he did the uh, Good Friday, or excuse me, uh, Good Friday march down, watch this. He literally or Palm Sunday, excuse me, he literally comes down the mountain, down a windy road, which we walked, and he goes straight into the gates of Jerusalem. At that time, it would have been the eastern gates. Now watch this. But he's up on Mount Olives where we were, and this is what he says to him. He says, now listen, it's important for you to go down there and wait until I send you the Holy Spirit. Well, hold up, wait a minute. Now we just hung out with you for 40 days. By the way, why, while he's saying that, he's being taken up into heaven. So he's just floating. And he said, by the way, go down there, y'all. Go right down there. Go back to that room because I'm going to hook you up in the next couple days. Now, what are the chances, what are the chances that he waits nine days? Nine days. Because he knows every Jew has got to make one of three trips and one of them to go to Jerusalem is Shavuos. So people were coming from all over the world. If they didn't make it to Passover, they had a, ch they had a chance to go to Pesach Sinai, the second Passover, which is exactly two weeks from this day beforehand. And we were there for Mother's Day. They were waiting there from every tribe and every nation, every Jew under the planet of earth. They waited nine days. And on the 10th day, bam, he fills them with the Holy Spirit. 
Either God is a God of coincidences or he done mapped that out because there's a conclusionary that God is saying, first, I gave you the word of God and man should not live by bread alone, but by everywhere that proceeded out of the mouth of God, right? I gave you the word of God written on flesh, but now I'm going to give you the word of God written on your hearts. And the only way I could do that is if I put the spirit of truth on the inside of you. On the inside of you. So either he waited on purpose or we just serve a coinky dinky God. I don't know which one it is. Okay. Now watch. Because if you just study the word, then you'll miss an experience with him. But if you just seek an experience, you'll have no depth. But if you study the word and you taste and see that the Lord is good, you'll have a transformative power present in your life. It will, why? Because the Bible says, the Bible says, and I wrote it down in a little, a little, little note over here. Uh, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, the spirit, pardon me, the letter of the law kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if you're not careful, you think, well, I don't need to read my Bible. No, no, that's not what it's saying. It's another idiom. It's another saying. In other words, if you don't have the spirit of God living inside you to help you break down the scripture, you're going to think God's a very mean, angry person. But what he's shown you is, if you just live the way I've inscribed for you, or I prescribed for you, you'll see that life goes a lot better. But if you want to go ahead and do you, don't come complaining when you got problems. Make sense? Okay, so let's, 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 let's get to it now. Let's get to it. Let's watch this. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all gathered in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house that, where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of fire uh, distributing themselves, and they rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit, what? Gave them utterance. Now watch this. That's the room. That's what they believe to be the historical room right there. Michael, is that you right there? No, that's Felix, Jose, Arshan. See a few of you guys right there, right? We were in that room. Strange thing, where they had the Last Supper, where they had the Last Supper, and they experienced Pentecost is the same room. The The last meal with Jesus and the first meal with the Holy Ghost. Come on. How many of you just want to go to Israel right now, huh? Like, man, it sounds so fun, right? Okay, so what's my point? My point is this. He says, go wait. And when they waited, they were filled with the promised Holy Spirit. Why? Because God is doing a new thing with with the fulfillment of the truth, an additional set of people, right, and all over the world. I'm going to walk you through that right now. Here we go. Okay. First part, there's a new law. Now, it's, when I put new law, there's a new way of being presented with the law. It's still not ten suggestions, but there's a fulfillment of it. Remember, Jesus took the ten, and he reduced it down to two. Love God, love people. Okay? And so watch this. And what he did is he said, the only way you're going to really understand this law is if you receive the Holy Spirit. I'll prove it to you. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of what? The Spirit of truth. Hold on. I thought you could have your truth and I could have my truth. No, there's a spirit of truth. That means the spirit you've been listening to is a lie. If you serve a God who's never told you no, you've been serving yourself. That was free. Let's move along. (laughs) That is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify about who? Me. In other words, it's going to lead you right back to you. Here's another. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. In other words, he doesn't speak of himself. He only leads you to the truth. Here's another verse. Because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, when the Holy Spirit, uh, with the Holy Spirit and deep convictions, you know how he lived amongst you for your sake to come. In other words, he gives you this gospel that leads you to this truth. This truth. So if you're living in an array of darkness, if you're living in a cloud of darkness, you must seek God and he will lead you to the truth. But if you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, then he's going to lead you into all truth. This is why it's so important. This is why we must understand on the mountain, you receive the law. 
But in the upper room, you begin to understand why he gave you the law in the first place. The empowerment to walk in it and not be crushed by the weight of it. So then check this out. He says, I have a new people. I have a new people. And he uses this word, an earnest guarantee, which is a real estate term about a deposit that means it is non-refundable. I'll prove it to you. He says, now you'll be my people. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of the what? Did you know that's why God can only help you if you're truthful? And that a 1% lie is still a 100% lie? 99% truth is 100% lie. Remember I told you the illustration of how I made my kids some cookies one time? Remember? Yeah, I real quickly told my kids, I was trying to teach them the importance of telling the truth. So I went out and I, and, and, and I picked up my, I have two little uh, chihuahuas. One's a chihuahua. It's a wiener dog and a chihuahua. It's the ugliest thing you've ever seen. And so I, I got a little piece of poo and I put it in the cookie dough and I mixed it all the way up. And my kids were getting ready to eat it. And I said, that's 99%, that's 99.9% cookie dough and 0.1% poo-poo. Gaka. That's what I said. Dad, why are you going to do that, Dad? That's a nasty Dad. So that's what, y'all don't want to eat it? 99.9% real, only 0.1% fake. And that's how God feels every time you lie to him. It could have been 99.9% the truth in that one little 0.1% caca. You ain't eating it, neither is God. It's always truth. He says to what? So you receive the truth of the gospel. And he goes on to say, I marked him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Watch this. Who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the day of redemption. That means neither height nor depths, neither angels nor demons can separate you from the love of God. If God put his deposit in you, he is coming back for a return. It doesn't matter if you die here or if he meets you here. He is promising that you are his and nobody can take you away. That's good gospel news. It's a no money back guarantee. This is how we know we belong to him. He says, you're my people. I got you. Now watch this. Last one. He says, I'm going to give you some land. He says, I want you to understand that when the Holy Spirit comes in your life, I'm going to so empower you that my number one thing for you to do, my number one job for you to do is to take this gospel message to the known world. Somebody once posted on their Facebook account, should every church have a different mission statement? Absolutely not. God does not have a mission statement for his church. He has a church for his already mission statement. And that is that we would tell the world about a Christ who's in relentless pursuit of a relationship with his creation because he is the ultimate creator. He has not abandoned you. He has not forgotten about you. He has not thrown the talent on you. He ain't, he ain't scared of no COVID. He does not social distance and he always executes justice. He is a God who is looking out for his people and he says, would you go preach this message? Would you go give it to the world? And I want you to see that the disciples already knew about Shavuot they already knew about being children of the law they already knew about the commandments but when they went into the upper room they got something they weren't expecting nine days because my God isn't a coincidence God he's an on time God and on the tenth day after an all night prayer meeting Peter gets up and he says, I'm about to tell you what God done did. He said, stood up with the 11 and he raised his voice outside the window. He said, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you what is going down. What you heard all night in a prayer session. He said, listen carefully and scooch at me. Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. These people are not drunk as you suppose. We might be acting a little tipsy, a little different, but the party didn't get turned up or turned down. I am full of the Holy Spirit right now and he begins to preach this sermon and this sermon of life and resurrection and power he said don't be satisfied with just the bread of heaven that was written on two stones when you can have the bread of life deep on the inside of your heart and the bible says that many were there and he pleaded with them save yourselves from this corrupt generation and those who accepted were baptized about 3,000 people that day church it wasn't a renewal it was a revival our god from heaven heaven showed up to be the God on earth and people responded this is how you 
believer. You go from an ordinary to an extraordinary. You go from Clark Kent to Superman. When you experience the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you go from an ordinary person to an extraordinary. This is how you kill your kryptonite. May you receive the power, the person, the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for everything you're doing. Father, I speak the words of life right now on the hearts and the lives of your people. Church, right now, extend your hands in front of you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless them now with your paracletos. In Jesus' name.